Welcome back. I hope you had a good break and I hope you had some fruitful conversations with your classmates. As you know, there's an awful lot to remember here. There's no way the panel or myself are going to be able to mention everything there is to mention on the 10 and 18. So your breaks, I'm hoping, are, are productive conversation pieces for you. The 10 and 18 consist of, think about, 28 things to keep track of. In the heat of a firefighting battle when we're asked to make decisions in an ever-changing, dynamic environment, this can be overwhelming. To help us simplify the use of these 28 items, Paul Gleason, a renowned hotshot superintendent who recently retired from the Park Service, came up with another helpful tool or process to help us with fireline safety. He called this process LCES, and it has become a very, very popular tool which is used by, I mean, virtually every wildland firefighter today. Hopefully you'll still remember that LCES stands for Lookouts, Communications, Escape Routes, and Safety Zones. To give you a historical perspective on the LCES concept, we recently sat down and talked with Paul. After sharing about two hours of Fireline War Stories, Paul's of course were much more interesting than mine, and swapping uh, hotshot smoke jumper jokes, which by the way, according to Paul there's only one real smoke jumper joke. <clears throat> he said the rest of them are all true. In response, of course, I told him about the one hotshot crewman that was so dumb that even the other hotshots noticed him. <laughs> Any, anyway, after some laughs, uh, Paul told me about the creation of LCES, its underlying concepts, and its original purpose. Let's listen to what this hotshot firefighter, which I'm sure is the title that he's most proud of, has to say. Yeah. Uh yeah, yeah, I was real fortunate uh, in, in the uh, 1960s uh, to work with some excellent, excellent fire people. And I guess I first started seeing them, not as LCES, but I, I started seeing the practice by working with, with these uh, firemen. Uh, and uh, it was right around the mid-80s, I believe it, it was the winter of 1985, uh, after doing some heavy firefighting uh, in Idaho with uh, uh, with the crew, I, I was uh, getting even more so concerned about their safety. You know, it's it, it never uh, taken me too much uh, to be interested in being aggressive. I, I like getting in and mixing with it. But uh, I started to, to really worry if I had all the bases covered. And, uh, you know, I'd uh, memorize the fire orders and everything else, but it seemed to me that I needed something a little bit simpler for, for me. Uh, to, to be with my crew to make sure the bases were covered. In the, the winter of uh, 1985, uh, what I did to, to take a look at, at everything again to, is to get the fatality r reports I could get my hands on, uh, starting with the Inaha fire, and just reread those reports, try to put myself in a situation, and, and I took a pen and uh, started circling key words that came up in those reports and reflecting back on an active fire year, uh, trying to see what made sense. And, and uh, as it turned out, I, I did this over the course of a Saturday one, one weekend. Uh, as it turned out, uh, lookouts, communications, escape routes, and safety zones are, are the, uh, the words that kept on appearing time and time again. Um, uh, at the same time, I was uh, studying mathematics and thinking about a systems approach to, uh, to things. And uh, uh, so that had influence. Plus, I was uh, reading a Mountaineering Freedom of the Hills where they talked about objective hazards being a, uh, in a, a mountaineering environment uh, as well as subjective hazards. And it, it just, uh, LCES, uh, it kind of came from that one exercise on, on Saturday. Um, what, uh, uh, what I did with LCES and is I practice it uh, next, uh, the next summer, I practice it with my people anytime I went into a situation. Uh, you know, I, I took a look at it as, as a safety system and made sure it was in, in place where the uh, objective hazards were present in, in the fire environment. Uh, the next year, uh, I was asked to uh, uh, present something, anything, in, in a three-hour division soup course, and, and I, I took a look at LCES, presented that as, as well as uh, some uh, concepts on minimum impact firefighting, and uh, uh, people started to to want to use that and think about it themselves. Uh, so I, I got a little radical on, on that one, too, as I got a custom-made license plate with LCES on it. 
I, as if anybody would know what the, what that was. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, then then there was a couple of opportunities later on. The dude fire is is one time that I felt maybe uh, you know I, I should uh, mention this a little bit louder as as well as there is a regenerated uh, uh, interest in uh, uh, 1994 after uh, South Canyon. I, I guess. It, a couple closing thoughts on LCES it is one, uh, I think it's a valuable tool. Uh, it was valuable to, to me. Uh, it's helped me organize my thoughts uh, and when I would engage in, in a, a good serious firefight. Uh, I think there's value in LCES. Uh, but uh, uh, something that, that uh, uh, may have been talked about at, at, at this time, but is the idea of a, a student of fire is to always uh, feel like there's some unanswered questions about safety and always to, to think of a situation or of, of safety or of a particular firefight that you're engaged with. Always try to find out the safest way to do it and not rely on, on just four letters out, out of the alphabet to hold it together. Or and don't even just rely on, on the fire orders or the 18 situations, but to to uh, develop a situational awareness to keep thinking uh, about the hazards that are present in, in, in any given time. You know, it's always interesting to listen to Paul Gleason. Uh, that guy is a well-read, well-rounded, uh, all-around good firefighter, and it's just always fun to sit down and talk with him. A couple of things he said that uh, stick out in my mind still is uh, being a student of fire, and of course that's what we're trying to do. This is refresher training, but we still want you to try to gain some more knowledge something additional that you haven't learned before. And uh, to do that, well, let's go ahead and just pick things up a little bit by breaking down LCES. The L is for lookouts. Now lookouts do more than just look. Think about what a lookout actually does for you on the fire line. And so think about this. What does a lookout do other than visually observe? Well, obviously, there's a number of right answers to this question. To name just a few, if you thought of taking weather observations, analyzing fire behavior, communicating fire behavior changes to the line personnel, uh, you, of course, you would have been on the right track. But now to help us answer this question, let's go back to our panel. Anybody? Well, Ted, as, a, as an aerial delivered firefighter, I had the distinct advantage of getting a bird's eye view of the fire before actually landing and getting out on the fire. Um, oftentimes we utilize our pilot or our aerial observer as our lookout. However, I want to caution that, you know, a fixed wing or a, a helicopter may not be there at all times for you, so you still need to establish a uh, designated lookout from someone that you trust. A lookout is your safety net. Um, they're your checks and balances. They make sure that if you don't see something that's happening, um, they relay that to you and, and you just have that, that safety net in place. Well, when you're assigning a lookout to, uh, to serve as a lookout on your operation, what kind of qualities are you looking for or what, what type of person do you want to have doing that? Is it somebody that's just got a, a dinged up ankle on your hotshot crew, Lamar, or is it a jumper that, that twisted his ankle on a jump or something like that? Who do you pick? Well, I hope not. I think a lot of times we use somebody to have more experienced personnel on, on, on the crew and you know that, that lookout is, is more of a liaison between conditions and, and, and myself, uh, other, uh, other members of the crew. And so you know sometimes we might use a guy who's got a bad ankle or whatever but hopefully he's got some great fire experience and, and background in fire. So he can give us some good, good knowledge of what's happening. And a lot of times we get down in the holder and we can't actually see what's happening. You know we, we're, we're trying to deal with what's on the ground. And we use we not only use just people from our crew. We we might use uh, uh, fire behavior analysts. So we use anybody. We could use the division soup also. And I think in a lot of scenarios that'll be coming up later, le later that that uh, you'll see that we use a lot of different person. We utilize that that position very well. You know, just kind of expanding on what Lamar said. Um, you know, me running an engine. 
I may not have as many people to use in certain situations, um, but I'm always going to, you know, especially moving in on, you know, initial attack or something like that, I'm going to pick probably my most experienced person at the time. And that can sometimes be hard because they are my most experienced, but I do want them up there because I trust them. And they're going to, you know, they're, they're my eyes and ears. They're relaying to me, you know, they're relaying information, weather, fire behavior, possibly, you know, having enough knowledge in the future or, you know, knowing that they're going to possibly foresee what the actual fire is going to do ahead of it before it actually happens. Um, you know, and I know we all like to get down and get dirty, get in the fire, but, uh, you know, don't look at it as, as a punishment if you're, if you're, you know, chosen to be a lookout. Look at it as an honor. So. Uh, when, I, when I'm serving as a lookout, I like to, I think it's important to do more than here's what's happening when you're, when you're relaying that information. Here's what I'm seeing, but try to relay, here's what I think could happen, or here's the possibilities of where this thing could go. Um, and, you know, and trying to stay ahead of the game rather than just observing present time observations. Anything, Hector? Yeah, you know, I think there's several different kinds of lookouts too, if I can elaborate a little bit. Uh, Brad uh, made a good point earlier about uh, having an eye in the sky and not solely relying on those in the event that they are going to have to refuel or be reassigned, etc. However, um, you know, there can be a situation where maybe a critical burnout operation is going to take place, that it would be good to have not only a lookout on the ground, but also an aerial observer up ahead, you know, just to make sure you're covering all the bases. On a smaller scale, it may be something as simple as a crew or a small squad is uh, dropping a technical tree, and you need a couple of lookouts to, you know, make sure nobody's going to walk in the way or some big widow maker isn't going to come out and clip somebody. So uh, just remember that uh, there's different levels of, of lookouts and, and post them as needed. Good comments. Well, next I think we'll look at the C in LCES, which is communications. I once heard an old jumper say, no mono camo. That's what he told us in our briefing. I thought he was talking Latin, but it, it really wasn't that. What he, what he meant uh, made sense, and that is share information. Don't talk to yourself. If you observe something, don't just keep that information to yourself. Don't have a conversation with yourself tell other people. For communication to be effective, you know, you have to share it. It must be at least a two-way communication or conversation so that the message given is the message received, and they're the same. My response, however, to this jumper was, you know, what, what are you talking about? But, <laughs> but anyways, that's the side of the point. Uh, the point is communications is the key component to any successful firefighting operation. And so we want you to think about personally what do you think is the most important element of good communication? So what did you come up with? Well, really, there's no single answer to that question. Yet we've all dealt with communication problems before. So panel, do you guys have any thoughts? Nicole? Well, Ted, I kind of like to break down communication into two areas. The technical area being, you know, that we're all on the same frequencies, you know, we're using the right repeaters, we're talking to dispatch, we're talking to our local cooperators, maybe the jumpers that are flying up ahead of, you know, above us. But I also like to break it down into the human, the human factor also. And as the old saying goes, just because you're speaking doesn't mean you're actually communicating. So um, you got to make sure, like for me being a supervisor, I got to make sure when I'm briefing my crews that they understand. But it's also their responsibility to make sure that they're actually understanding, that they're asking the questions. Don't be afraid to ask questions, no matter you know what your experience is, and you know just just make sure that we're not in such a hurry that when we're giving those briefings that they're actually understood. Because if they're not understood, we're going to get ourselves in a whole heap of trouble. If you don't have proper communications, to me that's a red flag and it's a no-go situation. Until that's resolved, you shouldn't proceed any further. It's a, it's a fact that without communications, you're jeopardizing your people, yourself, and operations as a whole. You're just, you're just setting yourself up. Can we, uh, go ahead, Lamar. I think he's exactly right. You know, you get to some fires and if you can't talk to division or whoever's in charge of that fire, you're not there. You know what I mean? It's just plain and simple. You should you should hold up and wait until you can talk to somebody and they can talk back. Get those frequencies together before proceeding on. And just to follow up on what these guys have all said is, uh, you know, it's one of the key components in LCES. You knock the C out of LCES and you get less. 
You know, we interviewed a lot of people this, uh, this last winter and preparing for this panel, and that was one of the questions that I asked is, is any one of those more important than the other? And it was surprising how many people thought communications, you know, without that one component, everything else can really fall apart. Now, communications we have to, you know, realize here is there's on the fire, fire line communication, and then there's communication with dispatch. And we all know that, that there's dead spots all over the place where we fight fire, where you're not going to have combo with, uh, with dispatch at all times. Um, but I think what we're getting at here is the vital communication, and that is between tactical resources that are operating on the, on the fire line, correct? Uh, and to go along with that, when you're, when you're dealing with different resources from different regions, different, uh, you know, backgrounds, you got to make sure your terminology is the same, people are understanding uh, what the goals are, um, you know, that's another aspect of communications that may get overlooked. No, that's true. That goes back to what John Krebs was actually talking about. It's uh, the supervisor's responsibility to share the information, but it's also right down to the last grunt firefighter's responsibility to ask and, uh, and to make sure that that message was clear. Lamar, you were telling me, didn't you have a, a crew soup once that, that made you repeat every message or something like that? And I hated it. I didn't know why I did it. <laughs> you know, you would say, uh, you'd give, you, he'd tell you what he, what he wanted you to hear, and then he wanted you to repeat it back to him. Well, it took some years to realize that, man, he, he's right, because a lot of things change. Uh, you know, I, I might hear it totally different than what you're actually trying to tell me. You know what I mean? So it's important to repeat it. But I, at that point, and I think when you're young and you're actually starting out, kind of getting out there and somebody tells you to do something and, and they're waiting for that reply. And you, you just can't just click and say, okay, gotcha, copy. Just that word. Anything else? Okay, and always remember if you're dealing with Hector to say things two or three times sometimes to, to make sure that that message got across. I learned that from Ted. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think we're ready to move on. Uh, now we're ready to move on, and, and let's, let's examine the E and the S together in uh, LCES, and that's going to be escape routes and safety zones. Here's another important think point for you, and that is escape routes and safety zones. Can you ever have one without the other? If you said yes to that question, then you're probably sharper than Hector. <laughs> Identifying and using adequate escape routes and safety zones is easier said than done. Nonetheless, they are essential for every fire operation. Lamar, you know, perhaps you could talk about this a little bit. You're right, Ted. You can't have one without the other, but would you want to? I don't think you would. I think, I think, I think they go hand in hand. Um, and, and you want to make sure that, that everybody knows where those, where those safety zones and escape routes are. Um, we're fortunate, um, being a 20-person crew, a hot shot crew, or any 20-person any crew, that you have enough personnel, hopefully, to, to you, you can assign a SAW team and a group of individuals to make sure that we cut those, those escape routes out and, and we improve on those uh, um, safety zones. Um, and, and that goes hand in hand. We need to make sure that everybody along the line knows, is, is, a, is aware of what the safety zones are and the escape routes are. Um, we don't want, we, we tend a lot of times, I feel that we get, get spread out along the line. I think you guys can, um, can say the same thing. You kind of get spread out and all of a sudden you got one guy that's way down on the other end of the line and, and can, you got to think about can he make it there, okay? And that's really important. Can he actually make it to the safety zone? And is that safety zone adequately marked or flagged to, that he can get there and, and actually get into the safety zones? Uh, we get in situations that that safety zone, is it adequate? Uh, today, uh, it might be, but tomorrow it might not be. So we got to reevaluate and look at those things. Kind of expanding on what Lamar's talking about, being on a mechanized piece of equipment and engine, we can cover a lot of ground in a short period of time. I mean, I could be 10 miles away from where I originally started, and I've got to make sure that I'm continually updating, you know, our escape routes, our safety zones, you know. I've got to... If I'm not doing it, then my crew members, I've got one person who's assigned to do that. Um, we got to make sure, especially working on these engines, I've seen it in the past and it's, it's really bitten some people. They're relying on those engines to be their escape route and their safety zone. But again, we, we run into problems with that, whether it be mechanical, we, we blow a tire. Where did our escape route go? No, we, they don't work. So, you know, smoke can cause problems, shut down our engines for us and we're stuck. So we've always got to be making sure that, you know, working that we're, that we're 
assigning those people to do it and making sure that they're known throughout the shift, not just at the beginning and at the end, but throughout the whole time. And that goes hand in hand, too, Nicole was saying that we need to make sure that other crews know what those safety yeah. zones are. Okay, and uh, any crew that might be coming in the, the, the following day on another shift, if we can relay that message on to the division or whoever's over that, that division, that there is a safety zone there. And it's adequate. You might have to go in and take a look at it and reassess it. But there's one there. Anything to add? Uh, how about helicopters? I mean, is there special problems uh, in your operations dealing with escape routes and safety zones? Well, typically you're going to be dropped off at the highest point if you can on a fire, uh, you know, remote access or whatnot. If if you identify a, a safety zone escape route, you have to remember that they're, they're more than likely going to change throughout this fire. So if that's the case, you've got to make sure your people are informed and they know the changes and they know, you know, where they need to go in the event something happens. I know one thing that's been happening a lot, and I think it's, it's pretty awesome, you know, with, with us, with GPS units, we, we tend to, we GPS it. We GPS it a lot now, and I think Hector and those, you guys get in that situation a lot too, right? Yep. And, and another thing on, on safety zones, you know, to, these are real good comments that uh, we've had right here, is, uh, you know, remember what the definition, by definition, what a safety zone is. It's not a deployment zone. You can go stand right in the middle of that thing when that fire goes around you and get by just fine without a shelter. And be realistic about size, different fuel models, different conditions. Let's say, for instance, by guidelines, they tell you that you got 75-foot flame lengths. Gosh, in the book, that says that's a six and a half acre safety zone. That's pretty big. Stop what you're doing. Reassess. Maybe you got to back off to that next ridge. Another thing that seems to happen a lot is you'll have an adequate safety zone scheduled. You can do everything right. You can time it. You can flag it. But additional resources show up. And a lot of times it's real easy to overlook that all of a sudden now that safety zone is going to have to accommodate a lot more people than what we originally thought when we were designating it as a safety zone. So. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of things to think about uh, when you consider both of them. Anybody else? Well, to summarize our look at LCES, let's just remember then that in the heat of the battle, LCES principles provide us with an easy to remember way to maintain a safe operation. They were never intended to replace the 10 and 18, but they're a valuable tool to utilize on the fire line. You may also have heard uh, LCES referred to as LACES. L-A-C-E-S, or CLUES, C-L-U-E-S. In LACES, there's uh, lookouts, and then the A stands for awareness, meaning awareness of ongoing activity. Uh, lookouts, awareness, communication, escape routes, and safety zones, LACES. Uh, I don't know why that's possibly easier for some people to remember because you, you, know, you have LACES on your boots. The other one was CLUES, CLUES to a safe operation. In this one, it's communications, lookouts, and then the U, stands for unified or, you know, meaning everyone, unified understanding of the plan. Uh, and that's basically part of communication, but if the, communi if the plan that was communicated, the message wasn't received and it was unclear, you got a safety problem. So it's communications, lookouts, unified understanding, escape routes, and safety zones. Uh, anyways, to wrap this topic up, let's go back and hear from some folks in the field. I think LCES is excellent. Um, it goes back to being to be in fatigued and under pressure on fire lines, you know, the, the more stressed you are and the tireder you get, the less you can remember in tight situations. And I think what Gleason did with LCES was just to consolidate everything that we know about the fire orders and, and fire behavior and the watch out situations and kind of chunk it into you know, lookouts, communications, escape routes, safety zones, something that you can fall back on um, in just really stressful situations. I, I like LCES. Um, I, I think it is a good tool. It is easy to remember, and you can't have one without the other in this situation. But uh, I still think you should have the, 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 the 10 and 18. You don't have to necessarily remember the 18 as much as the 10, but I think it's a great reinforcement for the, the 10 and 18. When I approach a fire assignment, LCES stands out in my mind is one of the first things that need to be put in place on any kind of incident. And generally how we do it and I do it is I will sit down with the people that are on the incident with me and we will agree on these things. And if it takes 
a while to see if this escape route is adequate or not. We'll test it out. We'll try it. And once we implement all LCES, then we'll continue on the fire. But not until we have LCS in place uh, do we really take action on the fire. And we make sure that it's known by everybody. All perspectives we just heard are great. But of course it's worthless if you don't put it to use in real life situations. Hector was kind enough to share with us a scenario from this past season where he utilized LCES. He'll set up the scenario by telling us a little bit about his situation and then we'll let you work with you in your groups to determine the next course of action, keeping in mind the LCES principles. Then Hector will tell us what really happened. Hector, why don't you tell us like you were there? Okay, Ted, uh, let me explain why I chose this story. Oftentimes in the past, you know, it seems a lot of my fire training with uh, fire line safety, uh, we often revisit uh, fatality fires or a lot of close calls. I thought it'd be time, uh, maybe a good opportunity here to uh, revisit a fire uh, that things went right and fire didn't make headline news. It was just one of thousands that uh, most firefighters every year are used to going on. Um, the reason this uh, fire uh, came to mind, it occurred in an area uh, where two fatality uh, fires were not very far away being the Battlement Creek Fire of 1976, which had three fatalities, and the South Canyon Fire of uh, 1994, which uh, in, in happened just in recent years. Uh, the day we arrived on this fire, uh, the current situation was, was some pretty erratic uh, fire behavior, and uh, the fire, of course, of small magnitude at that time, uh, showed a lot of the same characteristics of uh, what I remembered about South Canyon in 94. Uh, looking back at this fire, it's no wonder that uh, we took such precautionary measures and uh, you know we did we did what we did. So uh, why don't we take a look at this video and, and see what we think? The Gibson Bench Fire was located in western Colorado, approximately 10 nautical miles south southwest of South Canyon Fire of 1994, and roughly 12 nautical miles east of Battlement Mesa. The fuel in this area is comprised mostly of gamble oak and pinon juniper. Topography is steep mountainous terrain with many converging canyons. The winds in this area can be very strong, and at times it is not uncommon to see temperatures in the mid-80s to lower 90s, with RHs in the teens to single digits. Our wind streamers indicated 450 to 500 yards of wind drift, or wind speeds of roughly 15 miles per hour. Flame lengths near the head of the fire were in the range of 10 to 75 feet in length. A small district crew of five personnel was en route to this fire. The sequence of events that took place on September 9th at 1700 was that a fire call came into the jump shack at Grand Junction, Colorado. In recent weeks we'd been jumping quite a few fires, most of which were small, docile, two to four person fires. Upon loading the jump ship, no one expected that we would be going to a fire with this kind of behavior. Within 20 minutes we were overhead. We orbited the fire for about 10 minutes to evaluate the situation at hand and allowed the spotter to give a size up to dispatch and the FMO on the ground. Dialogue amongst the jumpers in the plane was as follows. First of all, we recognized a potentially dangerous situation. Fuels were comprised of gamble oak and pinon juniper. Flame lengths were up to 75 feet. Uh, strong winds, steep terrain with converging canyons, no vehicle access directly to the fire, no dip sites in the near vicinity. In addition, we developed a plan for LCES. Lookout locations identified from the aircraft were a couple of high points near the fire. One was across the main drainage on a road, and the other was above the fire on the north side in some sparse fuels. Communications. As we were all familiar with the local frequencies and repeater sites used in this area, it was not necessary to uh, rehearse any of the commo. The spotter did, however, reconfirm these frequencies and gave us contacts on the scene. As for escape routes, the old two-track road and a large washed-out gully adjacent to the road. These would be possible access and egress to the fire as well as possible escape routes if the fire should get larger. Safety zones. There was an open south-facing slope with sparse fuels and also, there was some clean burned black that had no potential of reburn. These would be our predetermined safety zones. Soon all of us would jump into a jump spot located approximately half a mile to the west of the fire. 
Shortly after we landed, the jumper in charge tied with the local FMO who met us at the jump spot. The FMO inquired if we had an IC Type 3 with the crew. At this time, I was appointed IC Type 3. I discussed strategy and tactics with the fire management officer. We also discussed ordering additional resources. He was very supportive. I suggested that two more crews would be needed in addition to the five-person squad and the smoke jumpers on scene. I also asked for retardant at first light the next day, as well as a helicopter with bucket. At this time, the FMO informed me that he would drive across the canyon to that high vantage point uh, to oversee the fire operation and serve as a temporary lookout. We utilized him as a lookout until dark. The jumper in charge and his crew of smoke jumpers began to hike to the fire and they were going to tie in with the five person crew at the anchor point of the fire. Also at this time, the spotter on the jump ship mentioned to us that two spots across the ravine ahead of the fire had occurred. LCES would be discussed with the crew as well as what the smoke jumpers saw from the air. I would eventually tie into the crew as well. A size up upon arrival was that the fire was still active. The winds had died down some, but the fire still made some occasional runs. We felt as though we could hook the fire before morning somewhere between 10 and 15 acres. It would be slow going in the dense pinon juniper and gamble oak. About 1930, I received a call from the additional hand crew. I tied in with them at the southeast corner of the fire. One of the crew members inquired about maybe lining the spots across a small ravine before they would grow larger. We'll stop at this point and have you work with your facilitator to talk about Hector's LCES exercise. There's information on this fire situation in your workbook on page 12 that you should look at. Try to identify what course of action you would take if you were in this situation. Think about how LCES is being utilized to make sound fire line decisions. We'll be back after a bit. Thank you.